Get out of here. Go. Get out. Not very responsive, are you? Just sitting there. For which I'm glad, actually. But that's the title of the message. Get out of here. That's what Jesus said to us. He said, get out of here. He said it in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. I want to read it to you again, what Paul read to you. But I want, and in the New International Version, but then I want to read it out of the message. Just because it gives a, a slightly different flavor. Same word, different flavor. Here it is again out of uh, the New International Version. Uh, and I will add a little commentary as we go. <clears throat> then the eleven disciples. Weren't there twelve? So when does this take place? This takes place after the resurrection of Jesus, before Matthias is added in replacement of Judas. Okay? So there's the time frame. The 11 disciples, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, went to Galilee. That's where most of them were from, not all of them, but most of them. To the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Remember after Jesus is raised from the dead, he says, tell the disciples I'll meet them at a certain place. So that's where they're going. When they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but not all of them. <coughs> Some of them doubted. Wait a minute. Jesus had been raised from the dead. We went through that whole thing with Thomas where he didn't believe the other ten disciples until he saw Jesus that he believed. So they know he's risen. They know he's alive. So how could the Bible possibly say they saw him and they worshipped him but some doubted? Just like nearly every other time, those core disciples are not the only ones there. So we certainly can have an understanding that there are other people there, other followers of Jesus, others who have not yet seen him resurrected. So some were going along with them because they heard that they were going to meet Jesus, but some of them doubted that Jesus would really be there, and when they saw him, doubted that that was really him, just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Didn't recognize him, didn't get it at first. Then Jesus came to them, came right up to them, and he said, his words, all authority in heaven and on earth, that's a huge statement, by the way, has been given to me. Therefore, because of that, go and make disciples of all nations, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Guys, I'm going to be with you always. Always. I'm never going to leave. I'm going to be with you always to the very end of the age. Here it is out of the message, same text. Meanwhile, the eleven disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up to the very end. Of the age. Jesus said all authority. What is authority? What is that? Well, let me give you a definition. Authority is the right to use power. That's what authority is. It is the right to use power. If you have authority over somebody, you have the right to use power over them. Or if you have somebody who is in authority over you, they have that right to use power. True or not true? Your boss has the authority, the power to hire you or fire you. To tell you what to do. Now you have some authority. You can refuse to do it, but then again, he, has, he or she has the authority 
to say, well, there's the door. Military, do you understand authority? Those over you who have the right to use power to tell you what to do and you do what? You do it with a yes sir or a yes ma'am. And you do it now and you do it right with all your effort. Jesus has all authority. Not some, not a little bit, not here and there, but all authority. And it's been given to him. The root of authority, if you think about it, is author, right? Author. An author has the ability to construct and write a story. In this case, somebody who has authority over us has the ability to write our story. Isn't that what an author does? They have the power to write the story of the characters in any way they say, see fit. And do you know that God, from the very beginning, before you were born, had your story laid out? And do you know that you took the pen out of God's hand and you messed it up? You started scribbling on the pages. You started writing things. You took the authority away from God. And you decided you could write a better story than he could. And all of a sudden your story didn't look so good anymore. But we also have an option. In that through what Jesus Christ did for us, you see, once we take the pen, God's not going to take it back. We made that choice. Except for what Jesus did on the cross, we are then allowed to give the pen back to God and allow Him to be the author again of our story. And it looks different than it did before, than it would have before if we never took the pen away. But unfortunately, we did take it away, each and every one of us. Jesus establishes his right and his ability to write our story, our life story. He has all authority. The entire Gospel of Matthew stresses the authority of Jesus Christ. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, look for how he shows the authority of Jesus. He does it more than any of the three other Gospel writers. That this is one of those bents he has, one of those things that Matthew sees about Jesus. And when you think about Matthew and his coming to the Lord, you know, Matthew was that tax collector, that sinner, <coughs> that one seen by others um, as, as somebody pretty horrible. And when he turned his life over to Jesus, just much like Zacchaeus, he really turned his life over to Jesus and gave Jesus all authority. And so Matthew stresses that throughout his gospel. There was authority to his teaching. We see in Matthew 7, 28, 9, he exercised authority in healing and in forgiving sins, Matthew 9, 6. He had authority over Satan, and he delegated that authority to his apostles in Matthew 10, 1. And at the close of his gospel, Matthew made it clear that Jesus has what? Just read it to you. All authority. Sure, could you bring me that right beside you there? Thank you. When we read the book of Acts, we see the authority of Jesus being used, being given out to others. We see that the early church operated on the basis of Christ's sovereign authority. They ministered in his name. They depended on his power and his guidance. They did not face a lost world on the basis of their own authority, but on the authority of Jesus Christ. Excuse me. That's it, I'm done. Hold on. The Greek verb for authority translated, uh, or not for authority, I'm sorry, um, for this word about get out of here. You know, Jesus comes later and says, all authority, um, and he says, go. He says, go. Says, get out of here. Um, and the word in the Greek really doesn't, it, it's not a command. In fact, the only command is to make disciples in the Great Commission. Did you know that? But go is not a command. It's as you are going. As you are going, do these things. In other words, Jesus never meant for us to go and plant ourselves in a local church and stay there. He didn't, he didn't say set up a church and stay there. That we're, we're not an organization. We're an organism. We're living cells of Christ's body. And so as we go, 
Based on his authority, we are to do these things to make disciples, to teach people, to baptize them. And we're to do it where? In all the world. How can we do it in all the world unless we're doing it as we're going? So Jesus is saying, get out of here. Don't stay here. Don't get stuck somewhere. Maybe it's not a physical location. Maybe it's a mental location. If you say, I can't get past a cult cultural barrier. Maybe I can't minister to somebody who's a different skin color than me. Maybe I can't minister to somebody who has pierced nose and ears and lips and chin and spikes coming out of their head or whatever. Um, that, that people of a different culture, of a different language, I, I can't minister to them. Um, <coughs> that's just beyond me. Are you kidding? Jesus said, all authority I have, therefore, go. In other words, he's saying, my authority goes with you. You don't go on your own. Acts 11, 19, now those who had been scattered, right? Where the church gathered, but then we become the church scattered. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen, first martyr, Traveled as, traveled, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Wait a minute. Even these people who were going stayed within their culture. Isn't that what I was just talking about? They stayed with their own people. They only preached to other Jews. Jesus never intended it to stay with just the Jews. Telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, ah, there's a remnant, there's a few. Men from Cyprus and Cyrene <coughs> went to Antioch to begin to speak to the Greeks also, to the Gentiles, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch to check it out. When Barnabas arrived, he saw the evidence of the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged. And encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And through him a great number of people were brought to the Lord. You see these couple of people who went first realized that they had the authority of Christ with them. But they weren't the only ones who were supposed to be a part of this. The Jerusalem church realized we need to see what's going on here and figure this out. They may have done it from even bad motives to say, oh, go check that out. We might want to shut that down. Barnabas went and saw the grace of God on these people's lives. And he joined them. And then Barnabas realized this would get bigger than he could handle. So you know who he went and found? He went and found this guy named Saul. Who the disciples, when Saul first became a Christian, became Paul, they sent him away back to Tarsus and said, we'll come for you. And they never did. Years went by. Barnabas is a smart one. He sees things better than most of those in Jerusalem can see. So he went to Tarsus to look for Paul. He found him, brought him back to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church, Paul, met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. What if they hadn't taken that step of faith? What if they hadn't gone beyond the Jews? Where would you and I be? What if Barnabas hadn't gone? What if Paul hadn't gone? Now they were first called Christians there, and it wasn't a good name. It, it was a swear word. Because they were called that by other Jewish people um, who saw them as something different. And, and they really didn't want them associated with Judaism. And so they called them little Christ. Oh, look at those little Christ over there. That's what they are. Like a bad word or something. So I want you to, to remember whenever you call yourself Christian, when you use the label Christian, uh, that it started out as a bad thing. That's an awesome thing. And that you are a little Christ, that the authority of Christ is in you. You have the very mind of Christ within you. And so as you go and share Jesus Christ, he goes with you. The term disciples was the most popular name for the early believers. A disciple is one who believed on Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. God bless you. 
I'll try not to spoil your keyboard. But you guys roll back and go ahead. A disciple is one who believed on Jesus Christ and expressed this faith by being baptized. He remains in the fellowship with believers that he might be taught the truths of the faith. That's the great commission to live down. But then he's able to go out and win others and teach them. This was the pattern of the New Testament church. This is how it worked. It's very much Amway, Shackley, all those kind of things. And how many of you have ever done one of those multi-level marketing things? And I'm willing to admit it. Right? <laughs> Any of them. You know, your goal is not only sell product, it's to do what? To get other people to sell product. And not only to get them to sell product, but to do what? To get other people. It's more about getting other people than it is selling the product, isn't it? That's why it's called multi-level marketing. Because you not only make money from selling the product, you make money from them selling the product and from the people they get selling the product, right? That's how the New Testament church worked. Those, those business plans didn't just come to somebody. Those are built into nature that God has given us. That's the way it ought to be for us Christians. The problem often is, is that we get settled into our Christian life and we forget those principles about going back to the first things. About sharing with others what we know. We kind of want to just keep it for ourselves. But we've got to keep getting other people and training them to what? Get other people. To come to know Jesus. Not for a product, but for salvation. Something much more worthwhile. The phrase, the end of the age, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age, indicates that our Lord Jesus has a plan. There's a time frame. His plan is to do for others what He's done for you. And to use you to help Him do that. It's a high calling, a great commission. Now I want to share with you a little bit more personal level. American Baptists have always been a people on fire for mission. Our church building has been transformed into a roller coaster theme of part. Colossal, coastal world. As a way for us to reach local kids, kids right here for Jesus. That's the goal of Vacation Bible School. Is, is to do the Great Commission. Is to teach them, to train them, to bring them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're on mission right here, right in this place, and you are seeing some of the physical preparation for that. Friday night, Marcia and Eden and I, oh, well, you're over here. Marcia, Eden, and I, uh, along with our local ABC uh, pastors and some of their lay people, uh, went and met with Kyle Williams. Kyle and Katrina Williams are some of our newest appointed American Baptist missionaries. Do you know that for a number of years we had a freeze on hiring any new missionaries from American Baptist Churches USA? For quite a few years, we were not allowed to hire any new people because of finances. Because we, we just couldn't send anybody else out. There were people like Wendy who were retiring and, and we couldn't fill their places. We couldn't go anywhere new. Now we have a goal uh, over the next several years of commissioning 15 new missionaries every year and sending them all throughout the world. That's international ministries. That's not even home missions. That's international ministries. Kyle and Katrina Williams are from Washington. They are in our region. There's about 35 regions of American Baptists across the country. We cover about a five-state area. Uh, and, and so they're from our region. And so we want to get to know them. We want to learn their heart. They're also going to the Dominican Republic of the Congo in Africa, not to the same mission place uh, that Wendy was, was at, not doing the same things. In fact, Kyle, one of the things he talked about I thought was interesting, <coughs> one of the side things he wants to do is, is develop an alligator farm. And I understand we have one around here. Is that right? I didn't know. In fact, I didn't know anybody had an alligator farm. I didn't know you raised them like for food and stuff. Um, but it's a sustainable resource. Now, they eat alligator where he's going, but it's not a sustainable resource. And so one of the mission parts he wants to do is for these people. By the way, the Dominican Republic of the Congo is as big as the eastern half of the United States. So for the Mississippi East, it's about that size. And they have about 500 miles of roads in the entire area, entire country. 
Think about that, how difficult that is to get around. I mean, when we think about missions, this is the place. Um, they do have internet, we found out, so we'll be able to be in touch uh, with them. But uh, if you remember when we had that missionary last year, the way the, the missionary got around, he showed us the, the video. He had that little backpack parachute thing. Remember that? Um, and that's, that's a way for them to get around because they don't have roads and so forth. They don't have sustainable ways of food, and so that's going to be part of their uh, mission. Anyway, Marsh and I got to meet with them with our other ABC um, brothers and sisters in this area, uh, and that was exciting. And so we're going to be looking at, at giving some of our money specifically toward them instead of just in general toward ABC missions. And we'll have a relationship with them, and they'll come and they'll share Every four years, they'll be back in the States, and they'll come, and they'll maybe plant themselves around here for a month and be a part of our ministry. So it's exciting. Some of our women went to the uh, ABW conference uh, up at camp, and, uh, always mission-minded with that. Our youth are about to embark on a week-long mission trip across the country. Kim and I, right after that, will be attending our biennial. Again, it's called Mission Summit. It's put together by this new organization within American Baptist called the Mission Table. And we're going to be having mission conversations. You get to choose which ones you want to be a part of and the things you want to talk about. We're getting back to our roots. We're going back to those things that we did at first. We're becoming an Amway organization all over again. What we have to give away is free. We're not selling product, but it costs Jesus everything. You will get to hear over the next two weeks two mission-minded men over the next two Sundays. It, it really grinds in a pastor's heart, particularly during the summer months, when the pastor's gone and attendance goes down. I don't know if you think I'm watching to see if you're here or not. I'm really not. So miss a Sunday that I'm here and be here when the guests are here. Would you do that? Um, because next Sunday is Clint Webb. This is an awesome pastor. I believe his church probably baptized more people in the last couple years uh, than anybody else in the ABC of the Northwest. Uh, he just retired. He's living in Boise, uh, going to the First Baptist Church there. So he's still he's fresh off the pastorate. Uh, he's ready to still preach. Going to preach on next Sunday on Father's Day. Uh, he is also in charge of the mentor pastor program, of which I'm one of the mentors uh, for our local ABC pastors. So he's kind of my mentor, my uh, trainer. Uh, and then Brooks Andrews, uh, whose, whose father served as a pastor at the Hunt Relocation Camp. Uh, his, his father had been pastor at the Japanese Baptist Church in Seattle. Since many members of his congregation were sent to the Hunt Camp, he followed them. And Brooks grew up in Twin Falls during that time because that's where his parents lived. Went to Lincoln Elementary School. Or was it even elementary school then? What, what was it? More than that, or still just help um, And Brooks is currently serving as interim pastor at the Japanese Baptist Church. Uh, so he's going to be here the following Sunday. So you're going to hear great stories and, and great uh, preaching from these two guys, these mission-minded men. Uh, Clint, by the way, accepted his, his call to believe in Jesus Christ at Cathedral Pines Camp and his call to ministry at Cathedral Pines Camp. He pastored in Idaho before going to Oak Harbor Church. Sure. So I'm just excited about all that stuff. At the Mission Summit, Kansas City will celebrate three awesome mission uh, history experiences. The first one is, do you know what it is the 175th anniversary of this year? Jim? <laughs> I, you don't you hate that? If it's history, the guy's going to the history guy. That be the Jets. <laughs> Say that on the next one. It is the 175th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, you say, well, that's not mission. What does that have to do with anything? Are you kidding? Do you know who many of the people were at the forefront of, of helping end slavery? The Baptists were. Let me tell you what happened. After that took place and the slaves were freed, what happened to the slaves? Do you think the people in the South were excited about letting their slaves go free? No, most of them, certainly not. That was their economy. Who took care of them? Who taught them? 
Who, who did the things for them that they needed to do to become a free people in society? Many of the Baptists, the American Baptist people, went south to help teach and train and love on those slaves because we had worked so hard to see that come about. Do you know that in this country, and we're going to go back another 25 years in a moment, um, there were just Baptists, right? There was this group of people called Baptists. Originally, they started independent. 25 years prior to this time, uh, they basically became a denomination wrapped around mission. But it's split in two, north and south. Over what issue? Slavery. And you had northern Baptists and southern Baptists. Now, even though we went down and helped, we couldn't establish churches very well down there. So it wasn't until the 1950s, and then again a slight alteration in 1972, that northern Baptists changed their name to what? American Baptist Churches USA. We were right. <laughs> Southern Baptists didn't have as much trouble moving north, but that's, that's the history of where we've come from. And Northern and Southern have tried reconciling over the years, and we do ministries together, uh, but there's still a couple points that have not allowed us to become uh, one. But anyway, so 175th anniversary, we're going to celebrate that. Uh, that's really mission work of the American Baptist Churches. Uh, in helping free the slaves and then helping take care of them uh, once that has happened. Then let's go back 25 years. It's going to be the 200th anniversary of what, Jim? Justice. And an Adam Justin sailing for where they eventually ended up, Rangoon, Burma. The very first foreign missionary from American soil to go overseas. And an Adoniram Judson. That is how we became a denomination. Because they went out as Congregationalists when they were first went to India. They knew they were going to meet a Baptist. They read the Bible. They said, oops, we believe the Baptists are right about this baptism thing. When they got there, they were baptized with believer's baptism instead of like Congregationalists with infant baptism. And so they considered themselves Baptists. So one of the partners, Luther Rice, came back to the Americas, went to the independent Baptist churches and said, look, put some money together. The missionaries are already on the field. And that's how we became the denomination because of foreign missions. We're going to celebrate that. And then, we're going to go back even farther. It is the 375th anniversary of the founding of the first Baptist church on American soil. Anybody know where it is? Providence, Rhode Island. Providence, Rhode Island, founded by a guy named Roger Williams, who was kicked out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, in the winter was befriended by the Indians, who had landed at this place and got an edict from the King of England. Okay, this is long before we're a country. Got an edict from the King of England that anybody, now this is the heart and soul of Baptist, this whole mission thing, and that whole culture thing I talked about. I just got, boy, I wish we had a whole lot more time. Um, that, that, that he got an edict from the King of England saying that anybody could go to Providence, Rhode Island, and it was named Providence for this reason, Without fear of religious persecution. So if you're a Muslim, if you're a Buddhist, if you're anything else, you can go there without fear of religious persecution. Why? Because Roger Williams had faced religious persecution at the Massachusetts Bay Colony from other Christians. He said, that's not right. People should be able to believe what they want to believe. He says, I want everybody to believe what I believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, so much so that I want a place where people can come freely and not feel that they're going to be persecuted. How many churches are so against other people? You think they're ever going to reach them for Jesus? No! He says, let me make a place where people who don't know Jesus can come. What an idea. What an awesome idea. Let me bring in the other cultures, the other religions, so that I can share my faith with them. Not in a, in a persecuting way, but in a loving way, the same way my Jesus loved me. Do you realize what ministry will be extended because three adults and five youth in your church are going on to the most needed mission field in the United States, Ohio? <laughs> Did you hear Kim? She said that would be Michigan. Um, they'll be staying and working at the Christian Conference Center. Eight acres of beautiful land in the midst of a very depressed residential area. It is a land that God has ordained and set there. The center works with dozens and dozens of children every summer for day camps. 
We have a field that needs reclaimed for more space for music day camps and volleyball camps that attract children that no church camp and no church could ever reach. We'll be going to Camp Kirkwood, very much like a Cathedral Pines, a camp that ABC Ohio could no longer finance. And so a couple of churches in Southern Ohio uh, decided they would do it. So it's still an American Baptist church, but not ABC Ohio. Um, and this camp reaches hundreds of kids during the summer, and they need laborers to do some work to make their efforts go farther. We'll be on a mission, I've said already, at this West Side free store that provides clothing, food, friendship to those in the greatest need. We'll be working at our host church, Hillcrest Baptist, where I was baptized, I was ordained, where Kim and I uh, were married, and where my son is youth pastor. That's going to be awesome. Uh, which, this church has also been a blessing to the kingdom of God that in a 21-year period, 20 people went into full-time Christian service. I mean, I mean, the things that that church has done and for the kingdom of God is, is awesome. I was one of those 20. They ministered to people in the same depressed, poverty-stricken area. We'll get our hands dirty working in a community garden that helps people provide for themselves. We'll provide free laundry and conversation for people who can't afford the luxury of a washing machine or dryer in their own home. Our church is on mission. If we can stand on the promises of the faith book and serve under the authority given to us by Jesus Christ and accomplish all of this in two weeks. I mean, everything that's, that I've just mentioned, from, from Wendy standing here, the women being up there, uh, the mission summit, going on the mission trip, vacation Bibles. If we can do this in two weeks and be this much on mission for Jesus, how much can we do in the next two years? It excites me to be a part of First Week, to be a part of this church that believes in getting out of here in not just staying stagnant and thinking that this is for us. This isn't for us. Jesus is for us. This is for other people. You don't come here just to get your uh, ears tickled a little bit and feel good when you go away. You come here to get trained, to get filled up so that you can get out of here. That's why we come to church. You know, we always quote that verse, wherever two or three people gather, there I am in the midst of them. Do you think that that's all Jesus is about? No. When the church scatters, he goes with us even more. If we're out there by ourselves, he's with us even more. <coughs> the moment they saw him, they worshiped. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. If you are on mission with us, praise God. If you are not, and you are simply warming a pew, we love you. And we are glad that you are here, but keep your hands and your feet inside the coaster, because we are in for the ride of our lives. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth. I've got to make this last point. All authority in heaven and on earth. What do you mean? Isn't Satan the authority here? Do you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness? What took place? One of those was that he was taken to a very high mountain where he could see all the nations of the world. He could see far and wide. And Satan basically said, look, this is mine. This is my territory. I took, God created it, but I took it over. God kicked me out of heaven. I took it over. It's mine. Hey, Jesus, but I'll give it back to you if you'll do what? Bow down and worship me. Jesus said what? He said to Satan what he says to us. Get out of here! But he meant it differently to Satan than he does to us. That you have no place here. In fact, you will see that I have all authority in heaven and on earth. And you'll see it through my blood and through the moving of a huge stone over a tomb. And when it's moved, I won't be there. Because I will be risen. And I will have all authority. So as you go, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I am with you always. To the very end of the age. If those who are going on the mission trip would please join me down here first. We have Emily, and Kim, and Nico, 
Mark, Amanda, and Thad. Uh, I'll let the deacons, would you come up here and join us? But I want you to be in prayer uh, for this trip. And uh, Kay, I'm going to ask uh, that you pray over us. So if you all lay your hands on us, we will go one another. our permission to go and serve. God bless you guys. Um, after the benediction, let's hurry up. <laughs> the flight leaves at 310. Oh, oh, Jesus, thank you. Now glory be to God who by His mighty power, His awesome authority, His power to do whatever He wants to do. Lord, may we do more than we could ever think or imagine. Now, glory be to God, who by His mighty power at work within us is able to do those great things that we could never think of. Now, glory be to God, through the church and through Jesus Christ, throughout all nations and all generations, both now and forever. And all those who are on mission for Jesus Christ say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.